All right. Um, so we're going to look a little bit more um, in this screencast about how populations evolve via natural natural selection. So we'll look at a couple of examples. Um, before we talk about natural selection, we're actually going to kind of talk about the antithesis of natural selection, which is artificial selection. And artificial selection, uh, you probably have heard of a million times, but not heard of it described as artificial expression. But this is controlled breeding. Um, and it's done by humans. And it's when humans select um, the plants or animals that they want um, to produce specific desirable features. So like say all of a sudden you have a tomato plant in your garden that grows these giant tomatoes. And that's going to be the plant that you harvest the seeds from so you can get more giant tomatoes. Um, or if you look at um, dog breeds and horse horses, um, they are bred to be a specific size, a specific type, right? We wanted a hypoallergenic dog. So we bred them, you know, bred all these kinds of other dogs with poodles so they would have hair so they'd be hypoallergenic. Okay, that's artificial selection. Um, one example of this is kind of our modern dogs. They're descended from wolves and they crossbreed. Um, and in only a few thousand years, humans kind of artificially um, selected for creating all of these different breeds of dogs. So you can see if there's a wolf and here's a bunch of different kinds of dogs. Oh, no Aspen, but there's a German short hair pointer, which is Aspen's um, relative. There you go. Uh, all right. So um, again, humans, again, cre create artificially a tremendous variation in a species over a short period of time. Okay. And if it's possible that humans can do this artificially, um, that mama nature um, could create even larger changes over longer periods of time. So uh, we're going to kind of look at how natural selection works um, in nature. Um, and evolution by natural selection happens today all the time. Um, we look at um, different species, different environments, different characteristics, and see how they change over um, a period of time. Um, and I'm going to talk, I'll talk in class, remind me to talk in class about the moths. Voila. Um, but uh, different things that help natural selection or that can be chosen by natural selection, um, different coloration of organisms, herbicide and pesticide resistance you've heard of in plants, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, um, all of these things get selected for by natural selection. Again, like um, antibiotic resistance, or we're making, um, because of all the antibacterial soap and spray and hand stuff we use, we're making races of these super bacteria that can withstand all of these things we're putting on them. Um, so we're going to look at a specific example of natural selection, and that is the Trinidad guppy experiment. Okay. So um, the theory is that brighter color can evolve when there are fewer predators present. Okay, um, and this is because female guppies prefer to mate with brightly colored males. Um, in a couple chapters, we're and we talk about ecology. We're going to talk about um, mating, and you know you always see, especially with with birds, it's very particular. You see uh, the brightly colored ones, like those red red cardinals and peacocks and things like that. The males are the very brightly colored um, bird, and they are colored that way to attract females to mate with them, okay? Um, however, the problem is, is that brightly colored males are more likely to be eaten by predators because they're more visible, right? So here are some guppies, and you see this male is very brightly colored, um, and so more likely to be selected by a female, um, and this male is kind of dull. I mean, yeah, whatever, dude. Okay, so um, we looked at, or not we, like I wasn't involved, but people, um, scientists looked at these guppies and they found males in areas that lack predators were much more brightly colored. 
males in areas with lots of predators were much duller. Okay. Um, the predators, the more brightly colored males were eaten by the predators, they're more visible. And so they did not survive to pass on their genes to the next generation. So the males that were surviving were the duller um, colored ones, and they were passing their genes on. So there were way more duller colored males in successive generations. Okay. Um, descent with modification. There we go. Um, so the conclusion is that when fewer predators are present, the brighter coloration can evolve. Okay. All right. Um, and this experiment kind of confirmed that conclusion. Um, if you, and then when they introduced predators into predator-free areas where the males were brightly colored, within just a few generations, male guppies in those areas evolved and became less colorful. Okay, so this just kind of shows how nature, how the environment, um, how the surrounding um, area, presence of predators, absence of predators, can help to um, select for certain traits in organisms. Okay, um, and again, remember the variations on which natural selection works, those modifications. Um, already exist, okay? And they are produced by chance mutations that arise spontaneously, okay? So just something happens that, um, you know, one male gets more duller colored than the other or more brightly colored. And depending on the environment, that is selected either for or against, okay? So again, natural selection selects for organisms that are best adapted to a particular environment. Okay. And remember, it's, it's not the best in any sense. It's not the, you know, best according to who's prettiest or who's fastest or whatever, but it's the best um, in the context of a particular environment. Okay. So when there are predators present, the best for that environment is to be dull and not colorful. When there are predators absent, the best is to be colorful. Okay. So uh, best adapted to the particular environment. Natural selection. Yay.